tonight on CBC Vancouver News. A man in his 60s who uh, had been in, in recovery at home. Coronavirus claims another life, the first in BC's interior also. Ensuring that all British Columbians stay the course, we all focus on the task at hand. Why BC is extending the COVID-19 state of emergency and... I, I remember the day when I was in high school when I thought, you know what, I need to be a doctor. The virus hunter leading our province's pandemic fight. What do you do on your Sundays off? One on one um. with Dr. Bonnie Henry. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. So what is normal and when might we return to it? Well, word today, it's unlikely to be anytime soon as we continue to lose lives in our province from COVID-19. That's right, Mike. Three more deaths to report today, including the first in the interior. Dan Bird is live with more on the victim. Dan, who is he? He's a man in his 60s who died at home. He sought medical attention before he died of COVID-19. We don't know what condition he had beforehand or whether it's linked to coronavirus. As you mentioned, he's among three people who have died in the past 24 hours. We've now lost 75 people in BC. We have 44 new cases of COVID-19, but hospitalizations are holding relatively steady. And most of those who have contracted the virus have recovered. Well over half, in fact. However, Dr. Bonnie Henry says after the end of April, she doesn't expect any changes to the restrictions we're living with into most of May. But in the meantime, we're still planning for what we can do um, once we start to get to that point where, where we're tipping over the edge, where the curve is not just flat, but it's come down. I do um, have great concerns about things going back to so-called normal um, when we know the, the amount of destruction and um, suffering that this has caused around the world. Henry also stressed that for people with non-COVID health concerns, it is still safe to go to a hospital and if they need to, safe to call 911. The province plans to release more COVID-19 modelling on Friday. Anita, Mike? Thanks for the update, Dan. And while BC's top doctor is cautioning, we are still in this for the long haul. BC's premier is hinting at preliminary plans to get our province back on its feet. Our Tanya Fletcher joins us live with more on that angle. Tanya, which areas might see an easing of restrictions first? Well, education and surgeries, Anita. We did hear Premier John Horgan point to BC's Economic Recovery Task Force and the long-term work it's doing getting BC back in business when it's time. But in the meantime, we heard him say that there are preliminary discussions about how and when kids might be able to return to the classroom. The biggest priority, though, would likely be rescheduling those thousands of surgeries that have been put on hold to free up hospital capacity. Now, Dr. Bonnie Henry also suggested today that only one percent of British Columbians have been infected with the virus. So I asked the premier what his message is to people who wonder if all the economic hardship, all the job losses, bringing society to a standstill, was it all worth it? Absolutely, he said. Were it not for the collective effort of British Columbians, we would have seen a different outcome. And that's obviously transparent when you look to the south of us in the United States where there are extraordinary uh, numbers of, of deaths, uh, uh, numbers of infected, and still no real understanding of where the, the, the virus is going. Because although it's been a very difficult road, I'm not diminishing that. If you look at the results, we should be proud of what we've been able to accomplish. And John Horgan also today extended BC's state of emergency once again. It does expire every two weeks, so it was a formality, but that declaration has been made in an indication that this is going to be the new normal for a long time yet. Anita? Tanya Fletcher live for us tonight. Thanks, Tanya. Now, the Premier and many others in our province have been heaping praise on BC's top doctor for her calm and clear directives during this pandemic. But what does Bonnie Henry's sister, Lynn, think? Well, she was visiting from Toronto last month, and when the crisis got worse, she decided to stay. Bonnie did say to me, okay, the one thing you have to know is that I am just going, I, I will basically be able to think about and talk about nothing except this virus. So you just have to imagine that I have, you know, a sign on my forehead that says COVID-19, and that's all that I will be able to think about or do. And I would say um, that that is true. 
More from Dr. Henry's sister and others in about 15 minutes right here. Our Tanya Fletcher sits down with the virus hunter leading BC's fight in this pandemic. Well, another North Vancouver long-term care center has seen a sudden rise in COVID deaths. Over the long weekend, five residents died out of 17 cases of the virus at the center. That makes it the third worst affected long-term care facility in the province. That's after Lynn Valley Care Center, also in North Vancouver, and Harrow Park in Vancouver. The facility is run by Vancouver Coastal Health. A resident contacted by the CBC said he is isolated and worried. And now you can't even go down to the door, right? To the entrance. And everything's wiped down here. There's an airlock and you have to put it. Anything coming in has to get uh, dropped and wiped down. Which, I don't know. I guess these are, I've read that there's care homes are hot spots, So they're being extra cautious. Birkin says his temperature is taken four times a day and staff are jumpy if they hear a cough. A woman has been arrested after allegedly coughing on a grocery store clerk in Coquitlam. Police say the 25-year-old woman became irate after she wasn't allowed to buy more toilet paper. She then deliberately began coughing on the cashier. Like many stores dealing with high demand for certain products, there's a limit on how much customers can buy. Police arrested the woman at her home after reviewing surveillance footage and talking to witnesses. The woman has since been released from custody and is expected to be formally charged at a later date. There's more concern tonight about TransLink's threat to cut service. Essential workers say they need public transit to get to their job. Leanne Young is looking into whether the outcry is pushing governments to give a bailout. Buses may be looking pretty empty nowadays, but the threat of reduced service is causing stress to those who do ride. It simply is a completely unreasonable additional burden to put on these workers, uh, so there really needs to be a solution. Jennifer Whiteside represents 50,000 health care workers. She says tens of thousands of them rely on transit particularly in the Lower Mainland, where uh, housing costs are so extraordinarily expensive. Many of our members live far away from where they work. It's not just those on the front line, like nurses and long-term care workers. Transit is critical to those behind the scenes too, people like housekeepers and food service workers. The wages in, uh, for those workers are particularly low, and that sector in particular really relies on, on public transit, and they may travel uh, up to an hour or more every day. TransLink says it's losing about two and a half million dollars a day, warning of significant cuts by next month if it doesn't get emergency funding. Ridership is down almost 90 percent. While volumes are certainly down, the importance of transit remains the same. This urban planning professor says his research from the latest census shows one in five healthcare workers rely on transit. And for other essential workers like cleaners, almost one in three need the service top officials recognize the significance. My perspective, of course, is making sure that we have guidance that TransLink is following that um, allows us to continue this essential service, and it is absolutely an essential service for many people. The Premier says he's been talking to Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland about the issue, but still no word on a bailout. If we can't get them to work, uh, we will fail. So we're working with the federal government, we're working with TransLink, with BC Transit and the par partners within BC Transit to find a way forward. No one from TransLink was available to speak to us on camera today, but they say those proposed scenarios for cuts could come as early as next week, starting with some of the least busy routes, moving on to some of the busier ones. But they are still holding out hope that the province or the federal government will step in with some emergency funding. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. it needs at least $200 million in provincial assistance to get through the crisis without severe cuts to services. Vancouver has already taken several steps to reduce spending and make cuts to non-core services. We've already cut approximately 10% across the board and we're on track to save $24 million through temporary layoffs and $6 million in other cost savings. These, costs have been, uh, these cuts have been extremely difficult to make as they affect real people. There are concerns some residents won't pay their property taxes. Municipalities can't run deficits in B.C.
Meanwhile, Surrey says it is going to be able to weather the financial storm caused by the outbreak. Mayor Doug McCallum says the city is experiencing a loss of $4 million a month, and it expects to have a shortfall of $37 to $42 million this year. But McCallum says the city is in a, quote, position of relative strength and has been able to moderate the financial impact. Surrey has given owners, homeowners, until September to pay property taxes due in July and its extended due dates for water and sewer payments as well. The COVID crisis is creating new hurdles for newcomers to Canada. As Mayor Baines reports, they have few connections here and in many cases little income, which could make them more vulnerable to mental health challenges. These days our rule is to stay at home, but <laughs> how to make money? Shan Zernagazi and his wife arrived in B.C. from Iran on February 19th, just weeks before COVID-19 measures went into effect. They've been trying to find jobs and find out about services to learn English, but are having a hard time because of closures affecting services for immigrants and refugees. Some uh, organizations like welcome centers are closed. We can't uh, contact with them. I don't know how to uh, fill uh, some taxes forms for myself. Uh, a lot of things like this because everywhere is closed and it was for so hard for us even to open a bank account, to get a visa card. He says they're surviving on savings, but not everyone is so fortunate in comparison. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, some immigrant services centers have gone online to offer services. But for people who lack computer and language skills, that may be difficult. The Immigrant Services Society of BC, based in Vancouver, says even worse, refugees who have been granted status are trying to flee from conflict or persecution are stuck. Even though they have permanent resident status, uh, there is about uh, 7,000 500 of these individuals that are awaiting in various uh, urban centers, camps, etc. He says immigrant and refugee single mothers are especially experiencing hardship. These mothers with young children are at um, considerable risk of vulnerability and social isolation. And uh, so we're going to be launching uh, uh, later this week uh, a fundraising appeal to be able to um, better support these isolated mothers and children. With Canada shutting its doors, Friesen's been told not to expect any new arrivals anytime soon. But the challenge of helping those who arrived recently remains. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. Okay, we have some breaking news now. A wildfire near Squamish is burning out of control. It's forcing people from their homes as the RCMP does tactical evacuations north of the town. The fire was first spotted just after 4 p.m., but quickly jumped the Squamish Valley Road. Police say the blaze is moving quickly and the conditions in the area are being described as dry. Air support is also being called in to help fight the fire. They are urging everyone to get out of the area, including residents in the Evans, Levette and Butterfly Lakes area. These air pictures were taken by recreational flyers earlier today. All right, let's check in with meteorologist Brett Soderholm. And Brett, uh, sunny and relatively warm again today, but this fire threat uh, appears to be real. It really is, and uh, it's pretty well everyone's biggest fear, I would probably wager right now. The conditions have just been so abnormally dry and the temperature is so warm, it really has created essentially the perfect environment for these fires to spark up. Now, just yesterday, I was talking about how the fire danger rating across the province was already at a moderate level, and already today, it's even gone up since then in terms of increased danger. I want to show you, though, first of all, when it comes to Squamish, just how dry it's been. If you can believe it, only three millimeters of rain has fallen this month in April when normally for the entire month of April we would expect closer to 155 millimeters accumulating in that time so they are a far cry away from where they should be and that certainly explains the very dry conditions I alluded to the fire danger rating you can see we actually have a few spots on here that are high that's what you're seeing in the orange there just kind of in the central coast region now Squamish itself and the south coast falls still under that moderate level and that is all because of these warm temperatures 
temperatures and, of course, our dry conditions. Squamish, coincidentally, the hot spot in the country right now. They got up to shortly, just about uh, 23 degrees, whereas here in Vancouver, the daytime high was closer to 15. Now, when I come back, I'm going to have your full forecast here for the south coast and across BC. And no surprise, it's still going to be remaining dry, essentially, from now until the end of the weekend. All right, thanks very much, Brett. After almost three weeks of silent greens, some Kelowna golf courses are reopening today. Initially closed amid the COVID-19 pandemic response, Kelowna Springs, Shadow Ridge and Shannon Lake golf courses say they're following recommendations of Dr. Bonnie Henry. Some of the new safety protocols include signs telling golfers to stay at home if experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and signs indicating physical distancing reminders around the courses. Management at Kelowna Springs Golf Club say increased precautions should keep golfers safe. Now it's really just a matter of making sure our customers and our guests respect those protocols. And I think that golf is a wonderful opportunity for people to get outside, be safe and spread out on, you know, 100 plus acre properties. Lots of space. To keep crowds to a minimum, golfers aren't allowed to arrive more than 20 minutes before tee time and they've reduced capacity and tee times by 25%. Just a quick reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. And of course, CBC Vancouver also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Well, she has emerged as a calming and powerful voice in navigating the COVID-19 pandemic in our province. Coming up, the path that led Dr. Bonnie Henry to the front lines of fighting the virus. And thanks for staying with us online for extra content during the TV commercial break. Well, there's no doubt this virus has put incredible strain on long-term care facilities. But questions are also being raised about what kind of shape they were in before this pandemic. David Common now with what we've learned about inspections at some facilities. With the death toll mounting in Ontario's care homes, a key question is, were they prepared? Surprise and detailed inspections like this one previously recorded by our hidden cameras exist to ensure homes are running safely. But CBC News dug through government reports, finding those annual inspections have all but disappeared for more than a year. Pinecrest last faced a resident quality inspection in June of 2018. Eatonville last checked in September 2017. Seven Oaks, June 2018. Anson Place, June 2017. It's a long list and reveals the Ford government has quietly stopped these detailed checks. It's incredibly frustrating to hear this. There ought to be inspections of long-term care homes, just as there are of schools and of daycares. But that, she claims, is not what the largely for-profit companies running most Ontario homes want. They have lobbied routinely for deregulation of long-term care homes, a reduction in the number of standards, a reduction in the unannounced inspections. And they have political connections. The chair of Chartwell, one of the largest companies, is Mike Harris, former Ontario Premier, who also cut the inspections before they were later reinstated. We will overturn every rock, every boulder, if that's what it takes to protect their most vulnerable. The Ontario government says every home is inspected at least once a year, but after complaints, critical incidents, and reports of serious harm. Critics point out the home knows the inspectors are coming and the inspection is less detailed. That's very upsetting. For those with parents in care, it's yet another concern. I think that's something that everybody should be aware of because it is, it is very scary. Her mother lives here. After years of facing yearly quality inspections, the last was 18 months ago. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Yeah, a very challenging situation, Anita, at our uh, long-term care facilities for certain. Okay, coming up in just uh, a matter of seconds, we are going to have a sit-down, one-on-one interview with Provincial Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry. Of course, uh, she's really emerged as this uh, calm and, and powerful voice or directives uh, are really resonating uh, with people. She sat down with uh, Tanya Fletcher, so we're going to have that in just a couple of seconds. Uh, interesting to hear what her sister uh, 
has to say about her. Her sister's living with her uh, in Victoria right now, Anita. Yeah, that's a really great interview. I got a chance to watch it. We also want to let you know about the National Town Hall that will be airing right after our show tonight. You'll hear from Bonnie on that show, along with Chris Hadfield, and mm -hmm. some really good interviews with some people who are still living with the coronavirus. That's all coming up after our show tonight. And in the meantime, we'll be back in a few moments with more headlines. A CBC News special, a virtual town hall. Heather Hiscox and Ian Hannah Mansing host this special live event, COVID in Canada, a virtual town hall. Tonight at 7, 8 Atlantic on CBC, CBC Gem, CBC News Network and CBC Radio 1. BC's top doctor is leaning on lessons learned from previous health crises as she fronts our province's fight against COVID-19. In a one-on-one -on -one interview with Tanya Fletcher, she found out how past experiences across Canada and around the world helped prepare Dr. Bonnie Henry for this pandemic. By now, you recognize the face and know the voice. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Bonnie Henry, the provincial health officer of the person leading a province through a pandemic. So there's a couple of updates we have this afternoon. Dr. Bonnie Henry has gone from public health officer to public hero for many in a matter of weeks. Her calm demeanor sometimes masking the power that comes with her words, delivering a message that's resonated in ways she never imagined. She's become an artist's muse. People have painted murals of her. Others have sung songs about her. You will lead us through self-isolation. The fanfare enough to trigger a blush from a public figure who shies away from public attention. It feels a little bit unreal and it's very humbling and it is... Uh, it's not something I'm used to in any way. Yet all signs point to an underlying passion that's been there since she was a girl. I remember the day when I was in high school when I thought, you know what, I need to be a doctor. But I didn't know what kind of medicine I wanted to practice um, when I was going through medical school. And I spent some time in the Canadian military. And shortly after, she discovered the field of epidemiology, or as she saw it, a career as an infectious disease detective. It just really struck me as, as exciting. It's like the Sherlock Holmes of the, of the medical world. And I, so I, uh, I fell into that relatively early on and it was, uh, it was an epiphany for me. Meanwhile, her sister Lynn recalls a specific story that started it all. When we were both still in elementary school, I uh, was taken to the hospital to have my appendix out. And, uh, and I think her, that was her ex first experience of going into the hospital. And, and in that moment, she realized this, this is what I want to do. Lynn lives in Toronto and had traveled to Victoria to visit Bonnie over March break. As life began to lock down, she knew she needed to stay to be a support to her sister. Bonnie did say to me, okay, the one thing you have to know is that I am just going, I, I will basically be able to think about and talk about nothing except this virus. So you just have to imagine that I have, you know, a sign on my forehead that says COVID-19. Late yesterday, we had um, our first case of a novel coronavirus. An all-consuming job, a lifestyle. And for Dr. Henry, there was one day that everything changed. I think of March 12th as sort of the day we learned a lot about what was going on globally. Um, it really was almost like opening a curtain and uh, the light shining in on a variety of different things. Suddenly, a virtual shutdown of society to protect the population a monumental task, one that drew on past experience to help. 20 years ago, Henry traveled to Pakistan, where she worked with the WHO on a polio eradication program. A year later, she went to Africa to help battle the Ebola outbreak in Uganda, lessons that would arm her for later. Having those international connections really helps you understand um, some of the, um, the sort of backstory of what's happening in different countries. And that's been, I think, very helpful for us. Then in 2003, Henry was in Toronto helping to lead the charge against SARS. It was an experience that taught her the importance of sensitivities around privacy. I talked to every single one of the families who had people who died from SARS, and I knew the impact 
that the disease had on them. That really um, drove some of the reasons why I've been so passionate about protecting people's privacy, about ensuring that we do everything we can for, for healthcare workers. It, it's things like that that stay with you over time. A lengthy resume that later led her to British Columbia. It was 2018 when Henry took over as provincial health officer. It was probably the easiest thing I've done as Minister of Health to be able to sign that order and introduce Dr. Henry at the press conference, but uh, she was the obvious choice. BC Health Minister Adrian Dix is the one who stands next to her day after day, briefing after briefing, co-managing a crisis together. She has, I think, the capacity to, uh, to explain complicated issues in a way that, people, that both attracts people and people want to listen to, but also that they can understand. I think what I'd like people to know is every single person matters to, to Dr. Henry, and you get the, I get that sense every single day. Yes, every person does matter, she says, and that's what keeps her up at night. But day to day, the only way is to focus on the good. Every day when I walk home and I watch people and lining up to the grocery store, and, and most people are patient and they're, they're working it through and they're working it out. And, you know, that's what allows me to sleep. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. And Dr. Henry will be joining us tomorrow for a CBC Vancouver special town hall. She will be joined by Health Minister Adrian Dix as we take your questions for them to answer. You can send us those questions for Dr. Henry and Minister Dix right now via email. Address them to CBC News Vancouver at cbc.ca. Then tune in tomorrow at 6 p.m. during tomorrow's newscast for the answers. Coming up after the break, we're taking your COVID-19 financial questions and putting them to a wealth manager. Send your inquiries via Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, or give us a call, 604-662-6801.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We have 44 new cases uh, that have been diagnosed in the last uh, day in BC. COVID-19 has also claimed three more lives in BC, bringing the death toll to 75. That includes a man in his 60s who had been in recovery at his home in the Interior Health Region. Uh, protecting ourselves, protecting our families, protecting our communities uh, from this uh, scourge of a virus and the pandemic that is seizing the entire world. The provincial state of emergency in BC has been extended another two weeks. The Premier says health officials will guide when and how restrictions are loosened, but for now, things stay as is. Well, the federal government is expanding eligibility for its emergency response payments. Now, seasonal workers, part-timers, and those on contract can apply. And as our David Cochran reports tonight, for some, the financial help can't come soon enough. This is just one of the five jobs Rebecca Gray works when things are normal. She's an aspiring opera singer, a paid choral performer, an usher at a concert hall. She makes her living working in crowds. It's really dried up because there's no more church services, there's no more concerts. Uh, my gigs have been canceled. So when the crowds went away, so did most of her income. The one job she could keep was teaching violin, which had to move online. So I'm making about $200 a week from the teaching job, but $800 a month does not cover any kind of basic living expenses here. It wasn't close to enough, but it disqualified her from getting federal aid until now. If you earn a thousand dollars or less a month, you'll now be able to apply for the CERB. The gap Rebecca Gray was falling through is one of several the government is closing. If you were expecting a seasonal job that isn't coming because of COVID-19, you'll now be able to apply. And if you've run out of EI since January 1st, you can now apply for the CERB as well. It's a lifeline, even if it isn't perfect. This is a really important step and I'm, I'm so grateful that finally they address some of our concerns, but that's still, there's still gonna be that dynamic of everyone is trying to figure out, okay, how much can I work so I can still get the benefit? Missing from this announcement was help for students who don't qualify for support right now. The Prime Minister promises that will change and that the details are coming soon. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. The Canadian economy shrank 9% in March and the Bank of Canada expects it may contract by as much as 30% by the middle of this year. There is a glimmer of hope, but as Peter Armstrong explains, it's well down the line. You need look no further than your local Main Street to see how hard Canada has been hit. The Canadian economy has shut down. The data just catching up. There are many, many businesses that are concerned. They haven't been able to pay and they don't know what their fate will be. Global GDP is now expected to fall 3%. By way of contrast, it fell just 1% during the 2008 financial crisis. In Canada, economic activity will fall a staggering 6.2%. Even the Bank of Canada isn't sure what happens next. Policymakers can do little more than to cushion the blow. The lockdown has clobbered just about every sector, but especially those that employ lower income Canadians. Different groups within society have been hit, you know, more seriously than others. We know from the employment data that women, youth and minorities in many cases are being hit disproportionately hard uh, by layoffs and furloughs. But if you squint just right, you can begin to see what a recovery may look like. Once the health crisis subsides, the economy will creak back to life. Your local shops and bars and workplaces all hope to reopen eventually. The longer it goes, the harder it will be to rebound. The IMF says a blockbuster year is coming. Global growth will soar by 5.8 percent. Canada's GDP will rebound by an eye-popping 4.2 percent. But that's still the better part of a year away. 
how you can flick a switch and open a Starbucks. It's a lot harder to tell people, go shake hands, go to a movie theater. This past month has felt like a lifetime. It's reshaped our lives and our economy in ways we can't even begin to measure yet. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. All right, it is that time of the show where we do our live Q&A. We often have doctors on the front lines to answer your questions, but today we're focusing on the financial side of the pandemic. Send in your questions via email, Facebook, or YouTube. You can also call us at 604-662-6801, and uh, we will try to answer them as quickly as possible. Joining me now is Sat Gill, who is a director of wealth management with Scotia Wealth. All right, Sat, thanks for joining us. I want to get right to it, so let's get started. Mm -hmm. uh, first question is, if people ride the downfall, how long can they expect it will take for their portfolios to bounce back? That's a really good question, and it really depends on what the portfolio is invested in. So if you're in 100% equities, when we went through this in 2009, the TSX didn't come back to new highs till 2014. Uh, however, if you're in a diversified portfolio, you had U.S. and other things, you were possibly hitting new highs in 2010. So it really depends on the portfolio and the structure of the portfolio. Um, that has a lot to do with how, how long it will take for them specifically to recover. Dan from Maple Ridge is watching on YouTube. He has a question. We've seen Tesla stock rebound quite strongly over the past few days. Is that a good indicator that the market is bouncing back? He says, my portfolio is in the green. Should I be buying the dip? Um, buying the dip is uh, traditionally has worked. It's worked every time we've had a major downfall in the markets uh, going back in history, and it will continue to work uh, going forward. So buying dips, if you've got extra cash on the sidelines or you can rebalance the portfolio to do that, absolutely does work. Um, and people should should take advantage of that for sure. You're not going to see a downfall stay down forever. We are going to recover from this. It, it will take time, but we will recover from this. And if you have time and you got time in the market, it's much better than timing the market. So yes, absolutely. If you can buy the dips, buy the dips. Next question. Should I take a loan and invest the money? Is that a risk worth taking? Another very good question. Um, at some people thrive by taking additional risk and and borrowing money and investing and doing those types of things. You really need to take a look at your own personal situation and take a look at what is it that you're trying to accomplish. You know, what are your goals? What is it that we're trying to do? And then see if leverage can be a part of that strategy. I typically don't recommend using a lot of leverage. Um, I'm, I'm more conservative that way. But for some people, if they're younger, they've got an income, they've got excess income, and they can use this opportunity and, and have some access to capital to invest, it may work out for them in the long run uh, beautifully. But you really need to take a look at your own situation because you have to make those payments. If the portfolio goes down or your investment, whatever you chose to buy in, doesn't pan out, you still have to pay it back. So you need to be really careful and just uh, and assess that for yourself personally. Should people be talking to their financial advisors about moving stuff around or just do nothing and essentially ride it out? Well, absolutely, you should be having conversations. Um, I believe in a goal-based approach. Uh, you need to know exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it, uh, have a financial plan, uh, and that should dictate what your portfolio looks like. And absolutely, you should be having conversations with your trusted advisor. Is there something different? Are you situated for a recovery? You know, what does your asset allocation look like? How close are you to retirement? Uh, all of those things make a big difference. And if you if you have a financial advisor, absolutely, you should be reaching out to them if they haven't reached out to you already and definitely have those conversations. doesn't mean that you need to rebalance your whole portfolio and change everything around, um, but you definitely want to take a look at what you're in and make sure that with the new economy and when things reopen and things get going, that you're positioned properly for that. Sad, I'm curious, as a wealth manager, you're obviously following this on the daily all the time. Has anything shocked you about the markets and finances during this pandemic? A lot of things have, have come up in the last month and a half that I didn't think would happen, for sure. Um, one thing for sure is just the amount of computer trading and the algorithms and the high frequency trading, how much they were able to control the markets in March, especially when we saw the 10% moves a day, 7% moves, and the emotion that it caused in, in individuals. Uh, you'd have a huge down day and people would panic and sell and thinking, oh, everyone's getting out, everyone's getting out. But it wasn't individual selling. It wasn't necessarily pension funds rebalancing. It was the high frequency traders. It's 
when they sell the ETFs, they have to sell the underlying stocks, and it's, it's, it's a bit complicated, but they feed off themselves. And, and they just took over and, can, and continue to on the way up and on the way down. And that really shocked me. I think, you know, a year from now, when everyone looks back at this, or a year and a half, whenever it is, the regulators are really going to have to take a look at the high-frequency traders. I know there's a need for them, but the algorithms and the computer trading and take a look and see, okay, how do we how do we adjust this so it's, it's real? And people don't get hurt because well, people panicked um, and they sold and could have been the wrong time because of the emotion that the high-frequency traders cause within the marketplace. Okay, we have a question from Tony on the phone line asking, how is someone supposed to live on a lower income during all this? But I think we can expand it. You know, there are a lot of people right now who are only on the uh, Canada Emergency Response Benefit or only on EI. How are people supposed to get by? You know, um, I remember in grade school, our teachers always telling us, make sure you have three months savings uh, just in case something happens, you lose your job, you get sick, something happens. Um, unfortunately, you know, the savings rate in Canada is, isn't isn't great, um, and most people don't have three months savings. So yeah, it, it's tough. You know, the government's helping; they're sending out money as as fast as they can. The banks are helping by waiving mortgage payments, and if you have a business, kind of working with you to defer interest payments and whatnot. Um, and be thrifty. You know, look for deals. Um, you know, what things that you have to do to adapt and change and and adjust lifestyles. I mean, we're not going anywhere anyways. We're all we're all in our homes. Um, so that's probably cut back on a lot of expenses, driving expenses. You know, maybe you cut your insurance uh, for your car if you're not driving around or, you know, there's, there's, we'll get through this. It's just, you got to make it through the next two to three months and just make sure that you hunker down and, and do what it takes to do that and ask for help. Maybe there's others out there that can, that can help you. The little things for sure. Next question is with the price of oil going down so much, would this be a good time to invest in resource funds? <laughs> Um, there's a, a bigger story behind what, why oil has gone down so much, which hasn't really been picked up by media and other, and other sources. It's not just the price of oil with Russia and Saudi Arabia. There's other things going on within the Middle East and, and regional and, and fundamental wars and, 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 and things like that. Um, oil has dropped dramatically. Now, you have to look at it going forward. Will the use of oil come back? Yes, it will. Is it going to come back to the amount it was? I don't know if it will. People are getting used to working at home. Um, people are getting used to maybe they don't need to drive in five days a week. Maybe they only need to drive in two or three days a week. Um, so you got to be really careful with the resource stocks. Know what you're doing. Do your homework. Make sure there's a, enough cash flow. Make sure they have enough to carry them through this because that that price can stay low for longer than people think. Uh, and if it does, we're going to see a reshape of the energy industry, not just in Alberta, but uh, in the U.S. and around the world. So just be just be leery of that. Just because it's down doesn't mean that it's a good time to buy. Sat Gill, thank you so much for joining us today. Sat Gill is with Scotia Wealth, answering all of your financial questions. Thanks, Sat. Thanks, Sat. 643, you're looking at a live shot. Uh, gorgeous. Look at Mount Baker tonight. Very warm out again today, relatively speaking. Lots of sunshine and more of that tomorrow. Brett's going to break it down next.
Well, physical distancing hasn't stopped a family from celebrating its patriarch's birthday today. North Vancouver's Bill Ewing turned 90, and since his family couldn't be with him, they sent him a surprise while honoring their Scottish heritage. Take a look. It's always been part of my life, you know. And I, most of the time, I hear the pipes and I just burst into tears. I just can't control myself. So, just love the sound. Like a true Scottish immigrant, you know. I, I, I can't imagine of anything that could have been more surprising and so welcome, really. It was just un incredible. We continue to follow a developing story out of Squamish, a wildfire burning out of control. It's forcing people from their homes north of the town. The fire was first spotted just after 4 p.m., but it quickly jumped the Squamish Valley Road. Police say the blaze is moving quickly and conditions in the area are dry. Air support is also being called in to help fight the fire. BC Wildfire says the fire is now 15 hectares in size and burning aggressively and it's issuing a quickly expanding list of evacuation orders and warnings. Check out Reserve just north of Squamish, as well as residents of Paradise Valley are now being placed on evacuation alert. All right, meteorologist Brett Soderholm joins us live now from the Work From Home Weather Center. Brett, uh, if, are we seeing things getting really dry across the province? What's happening here and, and how worried are we about these fires? Yeah, those are very valid concerns. Some of the driest conditions right now across BC really are across the south and central coast. Just yesterday, some showers were experienced in places like Kelowna and Kamloops and even into the Kootenays. So interestingly, they're actually not doing too bad. But over here, yeah, these are really quite dry. Earlier, I mentioned how Squamish only received about three millimeters of rain. Well, I want to show you where Vancouver is at right now because we've had even less rain, if you can believe it. This is two millimeters, 2.4 to be specific here for the entire month. Normally, we would have about 88 at the end of the month. So we're halfway through. We are still a far ways away from where we should be. Now, these conditions that we've been experiencing, these are just going to be continuing. It is certainly repeating itself day in and day out. While it's nice to experience the sunshine, of course, we do need to be mindful of how dry these conditions are becoming outside. But tomorrow, expect daytime highs once again, around 16 degrees by the water. And the reason for this pattern, the reason why we've been seeing such dry conditions, it all comes down to this area of high pressure. It's just not going anywhere. It's preventing much precipitation from making its way here into the south coast and it's going to be keeping much of the province dry tomorrow throughout much of the day and honestly beyond. The only chance of some precipitation is going to be far to the far northwest and northeast by essentially Thursday overnight into Friday. But still temperatures honestly 5 to 10 degrees above seasonal for a lot of people right now. Some of the warmest air in the province is going to be over Vancouver Island near Port Alberni and and that's going to be continuing as we wind up the work week. Now, if you're just itching for some rain, I had to go really far into the future here. This is the first sign of any rain coming. This is going to be potentially, I would say, more so Tuesday overnight into next Wednesday. So still another six days away before we get any of that rain to replenish our very dry grounds at this point in time. Now, forecast wise for five days here, go out into Vancouver, going to look much the same. If anything, it is getting warmer over time. We're going to see daytime highs anywhere between between 15 and 17 degrees right through the weekend. The only thing that's potentially more interesting than usual is the fact that it'll be slightly more cloudy on Friday, but that's going to be it. Those overnight lows, of course, pretty well where they should be. So in general, no relief in sight for that wildfire anytime soon. Okay, Brett, thanks so much. You know, this pandemic can get lonely at the best of times, but even more so for seniors who can't get visitors right now. After the break, how local students are finding creative ways to connect with the elderly.
A CBC News special, a virtual town hall. Heather Hiscox and Ian Hannah Mansing host this special live event, COVID in Canada, a virtual town hall. Next on CBC, CBC Gem, CBC News Network, and CBC Radio 1. Well, here's the question. How do you connect with seniors when you're not allowed to visit them during the COVID-19 pandemic? It's a struggle for anyone who can't hug their grandpa or hold their elderly mother's hand. But as Jesse Johnston reports, if you're creative enough, you can still find ways to make your elderly loved ones smile. We would like to introduce Mary. She is 93 years old. And what makes her smile is that she likes painting. She also likes spaghetti, chocolate, of course. And one of the best thing is she likes Robert Redford. Spaghetti for dinner, chocolate for dessert, and a Robert Redford flick? Who wouldn't want to hang out with Mary? She, uh, she just answered right away, Robert Redford. Trouble is, this is what passes for a visit these days at the seniors' home where Mary lives. When the pandemic hit, visitors were banned. And when people stopped coming, residents stopped smiling. Everybody was a little bit down, so we thought, why can't we do something to cheer everybody up? And our staff are wonderful, the residents are always upbeat, so we got together. They're so creative. Leslie Torresan figured the best way to bring smiles back was to get everyone talking about what makes them smile in the first place. So she got the residents to make posters, instruction manuals of sorts, on how to create big old light up a room grins. What I loved so much is happy faced children. My name is Emily. I'm 13 years old. My message to the residents is a smile is the prettiest thing you can wear. So smile. Smiling kids, it's a common theme on the posters, which gave the staff at Normana Living an idea. Why not create a smile exchange program with nearby Second Street Community Elementary School? It was a, a purposeful, meaningful activity right now. And so several of the classes uh, had their students make these um, smile for a smile pictures and little messages for Normana. Now the hallways are decorated with smiles and messages from students. Oh, the residents are thrilled, absolutely thrilled. We have one lady that goes and looks at it. She'll just sit there at the board and look at it all day and read out all the nice little captions and sayings and, and they just love it. As soon as they see it, they smile. Students get a lot out of it too. Just in them showing that care, it builds so many skills in them. It really fits with the core competencies in the, in the curriculum that we're trying to make kids be well-rounded citizens that show care for everybody. So this is Amy. She is 95 years old. When the pandemic is over, the students and seniors will get together for a big party because there's really nothing like seeing someone beam ear to ear when you're standing face to face. But under the circumstances, this seems like a pretty good substitute. Gerd, what would you like to say to the children from Second Street Community School? I would just like to say thank you very much. With no visitors, seniors' homes can still be lonely places. But whether you're 9 or 90, you know smiles are a pretty good remedy for loneliness. Especially when you can share them with someone else. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Burnaby. A smile for a senior can be everything during this time. We have a home right by our place, and there's a sign outside that says, make sure you wave to the seniors as you walk by. Yeah, oh, that's nice. I love that story. I mean, it's a, it's a challenging time, so you got to try to find creative ways to, uh, to try to connect. Hey, before we go, I just want to mention uh, quickly, passing along congratulations to uh, many of our CBC colleagues, uh, winners of 24 RTDNA Awards, the Radio Television Digital News Directors Association Awards, uh, including uh, Excellence in Video, the Hugh Hoglin Award. I went to Justin McElroy, that great piece he did on uh, street names. And Anita Bath, it's you, long feature, the uh, series you did called Growing Vegan. So congratulations to everybody. A lot of great colleagues we have here. All right, that's it for us tonight. Dan Burrett will be back at 11 o'clock. He'll also have more coverage on that wildfire in Squamish that is growing. Uh, and evacuation alerts are also growing. So in the meantime, go to our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Good night. <laughs>